Thank you, John. Boy, we've had a treat this afternoon. We've certainly had a lot of really good information out of our guest speakers. Thank you all, gentlemen. Time for questions. We don't have a lot of time, but um, I'm happy to take some. If you'd like to say who you are and where you're from, I'd be delighted to receive any questions from you this afternoon. Any takers? I've got a few up my sleeve, so if there aren't, while you're thinking about that, uh, a question to you actually, Robert Paul, because you were talking about audacious goals and it really made my ears prick up a little bit. I guess the numbers you were quoting were very exciting, but how realistic, how achievable are those audacious goals, as you put it? Uh, well, Derry had a pretty good decade in the 90s. It's one I refer to a lot. Uh, we had 3% compound growth. Some districts, Jeff, even more, like Northern Victoria. So it can be done. You just need to get on a bit of a roll. You need to get confidence back. Mm -hmm. So um, somewhere like Northern Victoria, Jeff would have gone from 1.5 billion litres in 1990 to about 3 billion litres in, uh, in two, 2001. Mm -hmm. So you get on a roll with compound growth you can do what the Kiwis have done. We've actually did it in the 90s. I remember when I started going to, um, I'm a bit, I'm actually a bit older than I look, right? <laughs> I, um, I, I remember the economists in the early 90s saying dairy in Australia was going to be 20 billion litres and dairy in New Zealand was going to be 10. Well, they actually got it the wrong way around. But, um, you know, I, I think if we go on a roll, we could get that 3% compound growth and get to back to 11 billion and then through that and, and start to grow to meet this high demand. Okay. Yes. Now the question, if you didn't hear up the up the back, was about cow numbers and and what Peter's expectation was with the predictions he made. Um, it, it's just really about um, uh, the, the the land we've got available and and um, um, the the economics of of of, um, of, of dairy farming. Um, uh, Rob was talking about uh, the, the growth and, and that sort of thing. Um, th there's only so much land in Australia that can, can, can be farmed uh, successfully for, for dairying and um, that, that's really that sort of driving, you know, it's, um, driving, driving the, the forecast. Um, you know, we expect them to, to, the farmers to respond in the short term to the higher prices and to increase numbers, uh, but then as prices uh, sort of um, fall off a bit in real terms going out, then, then that number in, in dairy cow, the, the, the size of the herd, will um, uh, not, will, will stabilise, will be pretty stable going out. Uh, so it's sort of just driven by the economics. Now, if I missed anyone up the back, it's a little hard to see with uh, Robert. Yeah, thanks, Lee. Rob Rochester, I'm the South Australian dairy farmer. Um, and a lot of the dairy farmers in South
process is not just done on the pulse of mobilizing this world. So I just wonder what the process is thinking there. And Robert, is that a question across the board to the to the panel? Yep. All right, uh, I'll go first. Yeah, look, we don't consider. Well, I mean, we're just we're a co-op. We're an extension of the dairy farmers' business, so we don't we don't operate separately to our farmers. We are just an extension of their farm business. So, you know, there's no us and them in that in this answer. This is just what we do as a farm sector, Jeff, as a as a co-op. Um, unfortunately, um, Lee, we're in a heavily export orientated business. Um, about half the product goes out of the country as export. About 80% of the product competes against mm. imports. So cheese, butter, spreads, powders, all compete against particularly New Zealand imports. So 75, 80% of what we sell is fully freely traded internationally. So the price of our farm, the price of the farm gate is predominantly set by that 75, 80% of the trade um, and the currency. So we are an incredibly trade exposed business um, and very, very, very influenced by that. 20% of the milk is daily pasteurised, which goes into the Coles Woolies Aldi food service sector. That's not as trade exposed, but the pricing of that is heavily connected to the other 80% of the milk. I, in my view, it's impossible for us to forward, you know, price ahead of that curve. Um, I'm sure John would concur. Uh, the risks to the companies would be just impossible to manage. So, unfortunately, it's the industry we're in, Rob. It is a volatile sector. But what we're trying to do is lots of innovation, lots of product mix changes, getting into daily pasteurised, getting into um, longer term agreements, where we can take some of the volatility out. But you know, I don't think any of us think that it's ever going to be removed from the agricultural sector. It's just impossible um, to do, isn't it, John? Yeah. No, it's kind of one of those things. Yeah. <laughs> so you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. I mean, there's plenty of discussion around different hedging models to try and, and take out the lumpiness of prices to cr cr create that sort of more flat certainty. But we're in a competitive environment as well, and, and you know, as soon, as soon as you find a model that works, you'll have a season like we've just had in, and where commodity prices have gone up and someone will miss out. And then the competitive nature will be that whoever doesn't have that model will come in and offer a higher price above that model. So yeah. that's just the, the, the creative tensions we have in, in a free-flowing model that, you know, the downside of that is, you know, a level of uncertainty and risk. Mm. Greg, did you want to add anything to uh, those yeah, comments? Yeah, I, I think I'd go a little bit different in, I think it's actually about, I think farmers should actually think about what their company, what their history of the company is in the product basket that the company is actually selling to the, to the domestic or export market. So you actually make a, a, a view on that and you can actually manage your business around that because that's, that's the reality is if, in my view, any business to be successful in Australia first at, at, successful on the global scale has to be successful in Australia first. So you need to have a reasonable domestic business and a reasonable export business. And I think you need to think about, as an individual farmer, how that actually works for the company you supply. It's just not about price, it's about the basket of goods and how they will manage those changes that might occur that, that become unexpected. Thank you, Greg. I think I'll have to draw a line there because we're now officially into afternoon tea time and I know all too well not to stand between uh, hungry people and a good cup of tea and a bicky. So our speakers this afternoon are John Williams from Warrnambool Cheese and Butter, Greg McNamara from Norco, Robert Paul from Murray Goulburn and Peter Collins from ABS. Could you thank them, please? Thank you. Enjoy afternoon tea.